This is the 401k Fridays podcast, and I'm your host, Rick Unser. If you're a retirement plan fiduciary or administer your company's retirement plan, you've come to the right spot. Our format is pretty simple. In each episode, we select a timely and informative workplace retirement plan topic, we pick the brain of an expert guest, and provide you a hard-to-find perspective you need to make informed decisions that benefit your plan, your employees, and company. Now here we go with this week's episode. When it comes to M&A activity in the retirement service provider ecosystem, to say the least, there's been a lot of activity. This is something my guest, Dick Darian, the CEO of Wise Rhino Group, saw coming and has been actively involved in. During our conversation, we hit on a few recent headline-grabbing announcements, how the traditional lines between service providers continue to blur, and the argument for how all of this M&A activity benefits employers, their plans, and participants. Dick also shares his thoughts on one of my observations that M&A trends seem to be moving in the opposite direction of the litigation trends. If you like what you heard today, check out my prior conversation with Dick back in February of 2019. Not a must-listen prior to this, but certainly if you liked what you heard today, there's other great information that Dick has to share as well. Finally, if you want to have a little fun while listening to today's episode, my microphone died midway through. See if you can tell when I had to switch things out. That's it. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dick. Well, Dick, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for being here. And a lot going on in your world, so I can't wait to hear what you have to say about uh, M&A and retirement plans. Rick, thanks for having me. Great to be back. Yeah, and I, I guess, I mean, I, I learned this a little too late after after inviting you back that uh, you're a wildcat from Arizona. My daughter's now a sun devil down at Arizona State, so b- bitter rivalry there. I, I didn't really pay much attention to that before, but now with a college-age kid, I'm, I got one more rivalry to, to keep an eye on. Yeah, Rick, I, I wish I could tell you that uh, either one of those schools is the Harvard of the Southwest, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not necessarily where you go. If you, if you pick one of those schools, look, they're great, but you certainly couldn't do much worse than uh, 340 days of sunshine and plenty of other kids who have probably the same mindset your daughter does, which is I want to do well, but let's let's make sure we uh, we don't uh, misspend our four years uh you know, or, or actually misspend our four years. So no, nah, it's uh, great memories from uh, beautiful Tucson and Tempe is a great spot. So your daughter's going to do great. Yeah. And she's already, already creating some fun memories. So on that note, I, again, I'll just, I'll say it again for where I started with, I, I can't think of a time in the gosh, 20 years I've been involved in this, in this world that we've had more activity in, in the M&A space. And And I guess before I dive in, just what are some of your thoughts? What are some of your observations about what's going on, what's driving all this, et cetera? Yeah, no, thanks for asking that question. So I'd start at the very top. You know, you you think about any industry in this country, the consolidation of an industry is a natural force, Rick. It's, It's like gravity. And I think if you look at any industry that can consolidate well, and and that and there are so many factors that go into that. But ultimately, if you look at it, you've got kind of this, you know, this uh, this natural force around scaling. And, you know, you've got uh, capitalism in terms of building businesses and you have reducing costs and and all that kind of goes into it. So you start with that as just a natural force and and that that will happen if it can. And certainly financial services all over financial services kind of working down. You're seeing consolidation. If you go within just the retirement space. You know, you see signs of, of consolidation starting with record keepers. And, you know, that's been going on for quite some time. And and those firms have evolved. And, and it's been, uh, you know, it's been about survival, but certainly scaling is part of that. And kind of how they how they manage their business and the services they provide have have changed through the years. You then look at, you know, within the advisory space, just look at investment consulting firms. You know, they have gone from, you know, hundreds, literally hundreds down to, you know, geez, Mercer, I think, is is approaching two trillion in in retirement assets under advisement. And you know, within that investment consulting firm space, there's only four or five of the large national firms last left and less than 40 kind of boutique and regional firms. So, you know, they're kind of in late stage. And then in broker dealers, et cetera. So, you know, we're at a point now with with the retirement advisory side, 
you know, there were there, there it's kind of the time for this business and it was inevitable. And but there were, you know, there were certain things that had to happen, Rick, for it to happen. And I think part of it is, you know, really the the emergence of uh, of firms that were that were big enough and organized enough to to be acquired. And, you know, it's not that long ago that the you know retirement advisory space really formed with 401k plans, fiduciary, all those things. And it's only been 20 years or so. So, you know, I think you can look at the M&A acceleration, especially in retirement advisory. And you could start with the supply side and say that, you know, the multiples for those firms are, are, at, are, are, are amazing right now. And, you know, I would look at Cap Trust and say that, you know, they've done an amazing job building a business in 25 years, but certainly Fielding Miller one day woke up and said, hmm, you know, 20 times adjusted EBITDA. I'm not sure if that's not as good as it's going to get. <laughs> so you have firms like that have spent 25 years building a business and you start thinking about the L word liquidity. You start saying, is this the time? And the answer there was yes. You know, they sold 25 percent to private equity GTCR. I think the second thing is maybe from the demand side, there is a firm like GTCR, a private equity firm really sees the validated value. They, they've seen other firms go through the process and, you know, they are saying, wow, this is a great investment. And I'll, and I'll talk, we'll talk about that today relative to the model that these firms have put in place. I think there's also, again, sticking to the supply side, you know, there are pressures that are forming on all firms from cap trust, but really more the unscaled firms. And that gets to fee compression and marginalization and commoditization, all these things that say, can I continue doing things the way I can that I've been doing it? And, you know, there are uh, there are kind of I call them walls. You know, I, I think of some of the firms that that get to a certain size size, Rick, and there might be two partners. And let's say they have eight to 10 million in revenue, you know, great businesses, but they're wrapped around the business. And, you know, they start with a capacity issue because all partners are focused on the business, uh, on the on the practice. They get to complexity walls then they get to growth walls. So all those things on the supply side, among other things, including, by the way, demographics and succession pressure and, and, and you know, a little more soft side, you do something for 25, 30 years, you're looking for a change. And there's a lot going on with these larger firms. If you look at many of the larger aggregators, many of the senior people, Rick, are former acquired firms. So it's almost also a, a desire to kind of do something different. So that's the whole supply side. And then on the demand side, you've got, you know, uh, buyers are bigger, they're stronger, they're better capitalized. You know, there's new competitors. You know, we'll talk in a little bit about who are the various competitors and how the, you know, all of the, uh, the, the lanes are blurring. But there's a big demand. And I talked about the validated value over cap trust and other firms. You know, there's a demand for those kind of firms. And then the last thing I, I focus on, and probably the most important, is the client. You know, the client is kind of looking for has different preferences. And I think when you think about these industries, clients demand better services, more services, nuanced services. And these are things that can't necessarily be delivered by unscaled smaller firms. You have a change in the way, even in, in the C-suite, how firms are looking at benefits and retirement together, you know, the convergence of those two things and data, and how do we provide a better outcome for participants? And then you have at the participant level demographics changing and their preferences around more transparency, technology. So all those things coming together with a kind of a macro overview of economy. And maybe that's a little different now, but certainly those are all kind of drivers to what's going on now with increased M&A, certainly within retirement advisory. All great thoughts. And that's going to give us a ton of stuff to, to chew on here. I guess let me start with what you just what you just said there about you know the end user because I've got to be honest I, I think that's something that as I look at all this M and A you know the business side of it I get like you you just talked about commoditization margin pressure growth etc but I'd love to get your input on you know whether it's Empower that just announced they're acquiring Mass Mutual on the record keeping side and you've mentioned a lot of the consolidation within the advisory industry the blurring of the lines between some of these, how does that all result in either, you know, me as a employer who sponsors a workplace retirement plan, getting a better, you know, offering or getting a better service model from, you know, from my new firm or from my firm, 
or if I'm a participant who is one of the one of the folks that's kind of on their journey to retirement and I'm part of one of these firms that's out there acquiring other businesses, how does that benefit me? I'd love to get your to, to get a little more more detail on that because I think that's where personally my biggest disconnect is, is is kind of those driving forces. Yeah. So you know I think it's interesting, Rick, and there's so many ways to approach that question. But if you look at any industry, uh, you know, there there are these demands, uh, the changes that take place with the individual in a company, let's say. But, you know, the, the, the buyer doesn't always know what they want. And part of that is because they can't really imagine or even have a sense of what the options are. And I would say for record keepers, especially if you look at where they've gotten to, you know, they're all pretty darn good, you know, and we're so far away from the days when there were good ones and bad ones. Now, the, 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 those that are left are outstanding and they provide amazing service. And they're probably doing things that even their clients didn't imagine 10 years ago. You know, think of all the things that are happening there. So I, I think you start with, as you have this consolidation, you have companies that have more firepower, better people, their imaginations. You know, look at Microsoft and you know, they, they have the imagination of what are the things that we can do for our clients that are going to be impactful? You know, who knew the iPad was even a thing 25 years ago? You know, all these things. So so I think in the area of of uh, in the C-suite, if you're in the benefits wing, you're just starting to get a sense of data and the use of data to provide the best possible scenario outcomes for the people that are with you. And also doing it in a way that it's going to, because this is what the CFO cares about. How am I going to reduce benefit costs? How am I going to increase you know, uh, wellness, education. So people retire on time with dignity, which is they define as keep my you know benefit costs low and productivity high. So, so I think the first thing is that, you know, the buyers in many ways don't even know what they want because they can't imagine what the options are, but that's starting to accelerate. I think that, you know, the quality as firms get bigger, the quality of the services are going up. You know, the, the level of the solutions is going up. But I think more and more, you know, delivery is going to start to be much more holistic and impactful and kind of just, you know, a lot more prescriptive in actually creating real outcomes. You know, we've talked about that now, Rick, for you know 15 years, but you're going to start to see kind of all of that coming together. And especially as, if, as you have, you know, one of the things they say about, you know, consolidation is, you know, towards the end, when you have fewer, bigger players, you tend to have those players working together in a way that they are providing better services. And I think that's the case with with our industry around data and sharing of data and using it and e- each party kind of knowing what they do best. The other thing that I think is important is and you know gets to who's providing the different services. You know, I don't think anybody thinks that having and, and look, no offense to fidelity, But I don't think anybody thinks having a Fidelity phone rep on the phone selling Contra fund to a rollover participant is maybe the best start. You know, I would argue that that, you know, having an objective advisor, having a conversation in the bigger picture. And I would argue beyond that, Rick, that that conversation should have taken place for years in plan. And so the whole idea of a rollover is is kind of ridiculous. I mean, it should be more. You've gotten counseling, you've gotten advice, you know, and you're already there. So I think I think that we're going to reimagine the entire way that, especially in plan, that we engage individuals. And I think that goes to those that are that can't participate. You know, utilization uh, of benefit dollars. Should you be using? You know, are, should we be forcing people in plans before they're ready? Once they're in, are we truly? you know, advising them correctly. And then lastly, ultimately putting all the players in the right spot where everybody is kind of at their most appropriate and highest purpose providing these services. So I think that's the end game. And I think that the the buyer is going to start to see that emerge. All great points. And and I want to bring you back to something you, you said last time we were together. And I think you, you, you referenced this briefly, which was, the lines are blurring between the different, let's call them roles. And I think in the old days, we had record keepers, we had TPAs, we had advisors, 
we had investment companies and there are some walls up certainly between a lot of those. And I'm certainly seeing this, but I think you were really one of the first ones to, to maybe open my eyes to just how much it was going on out there. But I guess as those lines blur between some of the different organizations, uh, you know, what's driving that? How does, how does that work? How does that benefit the, you know, the, the folks out there, whether that be employers or their, or their employees? Yeah. So I think there's a number of, uh, of factors that, 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 that leads to, you know, the lines blurring. And I think, you know, you, we talked about consolidation almost being a, you know, kind of a, a force of nature, um, search for revenue. You could start there if you just want to get to the, to the money, Rick, and say that, you know, the kind of the evolutionary survival of, of each of these firms gets to how do we make a living? And I think that if you look at record keepers, record keepers evolved from, you know, initially being, you know, bundled providers and, and, uh, you know, with proprietary offerings. And we went through this, the, the, the period of advisors becoming uh, specialist advisors, stepping in and really unbundling and asking them to provide record keeping services. And, you know, DCIOs and investments became detached. And then I, I think as, as part of the revenue search, you know, they began to focus on the participant and, you know, the focus there is, has historically been rollover, but then they evolved to engaging the participant. And, and now, you know, if you look at, you know, the firms that are getting bigger and, you know, Fidelity is already there and certainly Empower has, you know, an amazing service structure, you know, there are, they are going to figure out how do we engage the participant in a way that, you know, that we can, you know, not only provide great services, but build a revenue model. So I, I think that, you know, when you think about those those end users, if you think about the client, the participant and the plant sponsor, anybody in financial services, by definition, if you look at any way that they view the world, those closest to the client are going to be the ones that enjoy the best relationship and 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 win. I mean, that's just the way it is. So if you think about the the value chain, that means that, you know, the wh- where the record keepers were for a while and the advisors, you're now there's a little bit of a battle going on there around who owns the client, who is the one that, and that client is both the plan sponsor, but maybe most importantly, the participant. And, you know, we're kind of moving towards, you know, the uncomfortableness. If you look at a, at a, at a, a cap trust and some of those large firms, they full stop or focus. Now their model looks exactly like a record keeper model in that for years, the, consulting services, which was equivalent to say the record keeping services was how they made a living more and more. They are now shifting to, you know, in plan advice for a fee. And they're doing that to kind of establish a, you know, to use, you know, kind of uh, bigger terms or you know, base of operations to be able to engage the participant and full stop, Rick, their, their revenue model in five years will be dominated by participant wealth advisory. And they will get that money by relationships formed, engaging the participants. So if you think about the record keeping model and the cap, I'll call it the cap trust model, it'll sound really familiar. It's the exact same progression and they're after the same thing. So most firms are in that position. Now, if you look at the participant and you start thinking about in plan and you you take into consideration investment firms or DCIOs, they also have to decide, can we survive being out here on the spoke, third chair in the values chain, how do we move closer to the participant? Well, one way to look at that is to think of a Franklin Templeton who's focused on on managed accounts and how to and BlackRock and look at BlackRock strategy of building technology that will allow them to kind of it's almost like the shopping mall and they become a big box store and they have their stuff sitting on the solution. So you you have everybody trying to move up the value chain. DCIOs, record keepers, advisory firms, tech firms, broker dealers, because that position will guarantee them revenue and profitability. So, you know, that's kind of the model. That's what's happening. And I think, as I said in the other question, the end game is the right people providing the right services, the best position people providing the right services to the participant in partnership. So I don't think it's zero sum, Rick. But I do think you're going to see massive changes, significant fallout during this, you know, kind of musical chairs to to an ultimate ending. That was kind of a 
<laughs> that was kind of a, a big a big way to, to 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 end that statement there. So, what is that ultimate ending? I mean, what what does that look like? Is is that you know a, a good thing for some people, a bad thing for others? Or I think it's well. Let's go to the participant. Okay, so here it is: the advantage of being sixty two and independent. <laughs> the old model was the rec- you know the 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 you know financial industrial complex. Uh, which was the you know cabal between investment managers, um, record keepers, broker dealers slash advisors was generate hundreds of basis points in revenue, allocate that to rev share services, compensation. And by the way, who wasn't the winner there? The participant. You know, when I built the NFL's retirement plan back in the 80s, I put him in a collective trust at the lowest phase. Now, it wasn't because I was a good person necessarily, but that's what they wanted. That's what we did. The industry was built on, you know, significant fees to support a complex. If you think about what a firm like SageView, CapTrust, Gallagher, Hub, One Digital, et cetera, uh, uh, Lockton should have started there. You know, you guys were in business primarily to provide, to get, to use your clout and power to get the, the best services and the lowest fees for your clients. And with the positioning of more and more locked-ins, number one in the value chain, what I think, Rick, is you're going to end up returning the investments to probably to lower cost vehicles, CITs, or you know, lower cost mutual funds in the best interest of the participant. And it's not only lowering the fees, but it's also uh, for the plan sponsor, possibly reallocating fees to the areas where you can really impact you know, the participant. So there's no doubt that 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 where we're going, it's going to continue to go in that direction. Now, the ramifications, every DCIO right now is looking at this saying, and what I try to say to DCIOs, Rick, is you can't look at it as things are changing to, to, to the bad days. You just have to thank God that you had the good days because really mutual funds never should have been the spot for retirement assets. They should have always been put in lower cost vehicles, but it just didn't go that way with record keeping and technology and daily valuations. So we're actually going back to where it should have started anyway, and that's going to be in lower cost investments. So it's going to be it's going to be tougher for all of the investment firms to survive and thrive in an environment where there are too many of them and that don't add value and that you're going to have bigger buyers. buyers. It's institutionalized. And they're not going to be able to have the level of, of fees come in to support their complexes. And that's going to be great for the participant. That's going to be great for the plan sponsor. And arguably you and Lockton and your partners are the ones that should be making those decisions. And then, you know, it kind of goes from there. So, you know, there's there's all sorts of ramifications to that. And, you know, you see the record keepers that they're not going to have the level of revenue coming from these arrangements to support them. You're already starting to see all that. So they have to figure out what are the services that we can provide that will drive revenue. And it's all kind of converging at the participant, in my opinion. As you said all that, everything you said made makes, makes absolute intuitive sense to me. And I guess maybe just adding one more question or layer onto that in the investment side, how is this sort of avalanche of money that's been moving into index or passively managed investments how does that layer into this trend, this, you know, some of the things you mentioned about the the investment side of this conversation, you know, is that also driving some of the business decisions and dynamics behind the conversation or is that something completely different and unrelated? Well, I think it's in a lot of ways, it's a result of the institutionalization, Rick, which is, you know, professional buyers are probably going to use, and I'm not an investment guy, but professional buyers are going to use indexing where they should. And whereas an individual is going to pick, probably pick active funds based on the last quarter's return. And so just the institutionalization in the business, meaning target date, managed accounts, portfolios, you're going to have an expert utilization of indexing, which is going to be greater there than it would be on 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 a participant individual level. So, you know, that's that. And then you have decisions to be made. You know, the you know, the, you know, the plan sponsors utilization of a dollar. Do we spend it on investments or do we spend it on behavior? Do we spend it on, you know, education, all those things. So I think all those, but it's going to lead, in my opinion, towards more indexing and the most effective use of alpha. And then 
deciding where do we take the saved dollars and utilize some of those to drive behavior outcomes and other things. So, so certainly index will play a big part of that. I'm not sure it started with that. I think it's a result of the institutionalization. And I guess if we, if we come back to l- looking at some of the other individual components, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about record keeping. We've talked a little bit about advisory. Now we've talked a little bit about investments. Th- there's also a big consolidation going on in, or a lot of M&A activity in the third party administration world. And I, I think that has been fascinating to to look at. I had a great conversation with Jerry Bramlett a little while ago, where, where we talked about some of the work that uh, a census has been doing in, in that end. I had a fascinating conversation about this with uh, with a company the other day, just trying to explain some of the dynamics there with TPAs. But I'd love to get your sense on what do you see driving what's going on in the world of TPAs? And I guess, sorry for the TPAs listening, but what's the future hold there? I mean, is that a, you know, do, do TPAs have a position in this, in, in the retirement ecosystem three, five, 10 years from now, or is the, you know, is that business model is, are they going to struggle to, to kind of find traction or grow in this new world that you're, that you're talking about? Yeah. So, you know, I'd start with, you know, I built a TPA business in New York in the eighties, you know, actually programmed a record keeping system. So I'll say I've got the street cred to talk the subject, although it's been years you know, Rick, I'd start with you look at Jerry, you know, when Jerry was at a census and you know, building future plan, you know, there are many folks who have tried to consolidate TPAs through the years and, you know, hurting those cats is really difficult. And it starts with the nature of these unbelievable entrepreneurs who build TPAs because they have to have this, you know, so many different skill sets. And it's been difficult, although a census has driven that. I think demographics, you know, I'm not sure how many new generation you know, millennials want to be a TPA builder, right. but there's a ton of like 60 and 70 year olds out there. So there's a demographic factor. You wonder, you know, about the Secure Act and, and PEPs and, and the impact that'll have on all of this also. And certainly it will have a factor. And then you look at the technology that is available, uh, you know, this consolidation. So, you know, I would say that, you know, for the industry, the consolidation, technology changes, all those things don't bode well for, you know, you've continued to see the fewer and fewer TPAs. And then when you get to that point, uh, Rick, you tend to have kind of end stage consolidation where, you know, you've got larger players who can now, you know, the, the inflection point is lower fees. They can do all the things that a local TPA can do. So I wouldn't say they're going away, but they're becoming, there are fewer of them. Um, we have a, a, a ton of conversations with TPAs that are looking to potentially sell. A lot of it's about what's happening, the prices, you know, their future prospects. And I think that we're heading in that direction. So this is not an area of expertise for me, but I can tell you they are, they are you know, at least every fifth conversation is with a TPA about what do I do next with my firm. Yeah. And, and I ask that question with a lot of respect and reverence for TPAs because I have a ton that I work very closely with and I value the partnerships that we've created and but it, it's just the, the 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 volume of activity and the pace of change there within that industry I think is is it's 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 interesting so I guess coming back to the big picture of you know how all this looks and the, and the blurring of lines and everything else. As I've heard you and as I've heard others kind of talk about what the future holds, one thing that that I kind of have in the back of my mind that I'm just curious how this fits in is I look at some of the lawsuits that are out there that you know firms like Schlichter and others are bringing in the 401k world, and their vision or or, or the the plaintiff's bar and what they're I think trying to inject into the way that 401k plans are run is there's no sharing of data you can't use you can't use participant information you know there sh- all decisions should be made independently and you know based on best available pricing and services in the markets and you know and we can I can go on and on or in more detail about about that but I think you understand kind of the the general premise behind a lot of the the things that are coming out in these lawsuits and then as I look at just 
observe what's going on in the market and then also kind of hear some of your thoughts on what's what's driving the activity in the market, I, I kind of scratch my head every now and then going, okay, well, I get it, but we got this huge litigation pressure that's kind of saying, I'm working in direct opposition, to, <laughs> it seems like, to everything you guys are trying to do on the M&A side. So yeah. How does that reconcile? Is that something that uh, like in the M&A side of the world that they're concerned about, they're worried about, or is, are these just kind of two, two ships that are going on their own paths in the middle of the night without, without really crossing? Uh, is your question, Rick, more about how a buyer views that litigation and the risk involved in buying into it? I, I guess my question is, hey, I'm a record keeper and I'm buying an investment firm because I want to put those invest have those investment products on my record keeping system to make money from or or even more so I'm an advisor now I think it's a great idea to be sponsor you know to be developing my own target date funds that that I'm going to be selling into the market or um to your point like the managed account stuff hey I'm whatever now I'm going to start selling my own managed account things uh and and like I said I mean, my humble observation is that what you know, and I've talked to Schlichter and I've talked to a bunch of the other plaintiff's attorneys on the podcast. And you know, and what I hear from them consistently is listen, I get it, but you've got to be able to make these decisions and you can't just be like, oh, well, that was convenient. Let me flip this switch because they have it. You know, was that the best? Was that the, the best that was available? What the service, price, quality, experience, whatever, you know, and and I and I like I said, and that's where I feel like there's this. You know, but all of this stuff going on with the M and A sort of is is going in the opposite direction of what the plaintiffs bar is doing, and and, and in some ways, sort of successfully arguing, in and getting large settlements from the plan sponsors as a result. So, Rick, I I would look at the consolidation of the retirement advisory business as moving in a direction that will be a positive for participants and plan sponsors, and ultimately, if you were a lawyer you know, looking to to sue on the fiduciary side, you're gonna have you're gonna have less to sue about as as that as that happens. And I think that's because you know these larger firms are gonna use their clout to drive better opportunities, better products, lower prices, more services for their clients. So you just start there and say, to me that's a positive outcome. I think if you look at these large firms uh, and their ability to uh, negotiate for example, better pricing, most favored nation pricing for, you know, S&P 500 index fund, you know, it's going to become tougher and tougher for the individual unscaled businesses to justify, you know, how do they compete? Are they even, is it a fiduciary issue not making a change to a larger firm to be able to offer those things? So, so there's always this conflict, you know, I mean, I, I think even in every business in the U.S., you look at the federal thrift savings plan where they get the, the best price of all for indexing. Why don't we all use that? So, you know, capitalism has, is always going to have conflicts and of interest. But the question is, what's acceptable? And you have to provide some economics for people to be interested in providing services. And, you know, in the old days, Rick, you know, I started in the early 80s. We sat in lunchrooms and hospitals and met with doctors. Now, yeah. They paid us a lot of money to do that, but we provide, um, you know, it was, it was a one-on-one -on -one customized service. Was that, was that a ripoff? I don't think so. And today, if you're at 10 basis points, no one's going to provide those services. So there's got to be this right balance of the fee and, and value and services. And I think, you know, the, the thing that's missing with the attorneys, you know, they're conflicted. They're not here because they want to save the world. They want to, you know, drive revenue. But at the same time, it's not just about you know, what is the value? And is that something that really shows up in the lawsuits? And often it does not. But I do think we're getting to an equilibrium, Rick. And I think that these fiduciary in these lawsuits play a role in keep making sure we're moving towards what I said before, which 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 is that ultimately services will be provided by the by the right person who's got the best skill set to do that. And in my opinion, I think things like advice are, are best provided by a, an advisor who's not uh, who's not selling a product. And I think that record keepers do certain things well, and I think that BDs and et cetera, and everybody knows their, their, their right place. And then when that happens and you have the right level of scaling, the prices are, are right. And I, I think the lawsuits are, are going to be a part of that equilibrium. But 
shouldn't shouldn't force it or define it. No, and I think based on conversations I've had on the podcast with some of the attorneys that are that are filing these lawsuits and getting the settlements and things of that nature, as you said, you know, most of them are not ERISA experts or most of them are not let's just say are not ERISA experts and are looking at opportunities to exploit or let, let's just say find areas where they feel they can make a case and get a settlement. Um, I, I do. Th- I, I think I, I really would just echo what you said. I think there will come a point of equilibrium. I think some of the some of the directions that that some of these lawsuits are headed. I mean, hey, I, I know people are getting sued, uh, but it'll be interesting to see what the results are from some of those. Obviously, the fee side of things has been very, 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 very fruitful and very, very successful for a lot of firms out there. But we'll see how data and and some of the other some of the other areas that people are trying to go right now. We'll, we'll just we'll see how those play out in the you know in the coming years and and uh, and months even. The other thing that as, as you've talked about this and as we see this we see more consolidation. I think a lot of people on the employer level that are dealing with 401k plans also probably tangentially are dealing with their their health benefits. And and again, I'm no expert in health benefits, but the what I see observationally is we've kind of gotten down to what three or four major players in the health insurance industry if you are a, you know, a company that is offering benefits to your employees. You know, you've got three or four big players to to really choose from. I we're not there yet in the retirement space. I mean, we I think we certainly there's certainly some big big players out there. But do you, is that where we're headed? Do you think? I mean, are we getting to the point where there's going to be three, four, five players? And as as if I may, if I have a four hundred one k plan, whether it's a million dollar plan or a hundred million dollar plan or a billion dollar plan there's going to be kind of the same four people that I can go to, or do you think we, we see a survival of more firms or maybe firms get a lot more specific in terms of the markets that they're trying to serve? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but that that's just another thing that as you were talking through it, I was just curious, you know, what your thoughts are in terms of how things evolve. Yeah. So, um, you know, I tend to, when I was at BlackRock, Rick, you know, the, the thing they did a good job of there is kind of training you to to look at the you know look at risk manage risk and and kind of look at the you know the black swan events and say let's let's kind of manage to to uh you know confidently to to the big win but let's kind of let's let's look at downside and i think that when you look at think about cap trust and where that's going and so cap trust has you know i'll be close on this call 380 billion and Retirement in retirement AUA, and they've got about you know ballpark twenty billion in wealth AUA, and you know they've built a nice advice business that's just ramping up, and you know they're up to you know over certainly over uh, you know ten million, probably twenty million in advice revenue. So they've gone to their clients saying we'll provide implant advice, and it's the whole continuum from you know the C suite and the CEO providing family office services down to on-site advice, onto phone counseling, down to technology and wellness. And, you know, if you look at that model, the, you know, the revenue that they're getting now, you, you know, in looking at their business and, you know, we, we bring a lot of business to all the, the buyers out there, including CapTrust, that model of 380 billion in retirement assets and 20 billion in wealth assets, it's getting close to being about 50-50 in, in revenue and profitability. So you stop there for a second and go, wow. So it gives you a sense of where the business is going. And you know, they've got this model, Rick, where about one in every eight or so, you know, engagements on the advice side turn into a full wealth engagement in their target group, which are the, you know, I'd say the higher end of the mass affluent. And so w- what does that mean? If you go to the record keeping side, Record keepers more and more, their motto was, you know, give away the record keeping for free. You know, you remember those days because they were doing it. So we're kind of at the I don't I'm not going to say that CapTrust is going to give it give the consulting away for free. But what they recognize is that, you know, they can kind of lose it on the popcorn and make it up in the peanuts. (laughs) And they can begin to say, well, if we can get a hundred million dollar plan with a thousand participants, we know that our margins are going to be entirely made in advice and wealth. So that so how much we charge for the retirement gig 
We just need the gig. So that'll have an impact on the rest of the ecosystem. And more and more firms are going. So it's not just, you know, that's going to change the game because it changed it for record keepers and it changes it for every business. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, the reality is it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher for unscaled firms to survive. And, you know, like anything, there's always going to be the leaders. There's always going to be the niche players and the ones in the middle. It's going to be tough and it's going to be tougher and tougher to survive. And I, I, I'd add to that, you know, will PEPs and small plan solutions become, you know, bigger? And, you know, it happened in Great Britain where, you know, they went to the master trust arrangements and now they're all managed by, you know, there's probably seven big providers over there. So all those questions remain. And I would say there will be fewer players for sure. I think that doesn't mean there's going to be, you know, seven monoliths, but there might be, if you look at the investment consulting world, you know, there are, you know, five national players. You just had the merger of Mercer and Aon that's going on. It's the merger of the, it's the, it's the merger of the mergers. And I would expect the same thing in our space, Rick, but what we look at is, you know, we have call it 15 large aggregators with a trillion and a half. We have, you know, probably a hundred firms out there that are traditional, you know, uh, advisory, retirement and wealth advisory that, I'm going to say are, you know, up to 15 million in revenue, you know, uh, regional dominators, we call them. And then there's another 750 firms that that we track that are, you know, over a million, million and a half in revenue that are vital and doing very well. We're years away from this outcome, but we're moving in that direction. And if we follow the retirement advisory side of things, follows the rest of the business in five years, the landscape's going to look a lot different. Yeah, and the pace of change would certainly warrant or, or justify that uh, that prediction there that you're that you're talking about. As you were talking as well, one question that that I that comes to mind is I think there's a lot of groups out there who are very passionate, very will very fiercely defend their independence or their sort of lack of other things that they do. And you know, as you were kind of describing what you just said there. Is that the the niche, is that what you would kind of refer to as like a niche player, somebody that is, hey, I've got one thing, I'm a rifle shot, I do that really well, or is that somebody that you see more in danger of kind of falling in the middle of what you were talking about, where they they're unscaled and and they potentially are going to have a hard time surviving? Like like how would you how would you frame or categorize those? groups out there that again are just you know fiercely independent and are, are and that's really what they're they're hanging on to as their as their value you know rick i would say in every in every industry that's had consolidation you're always going to have certain players that are so good or so connected or have a niche in a certain industry where they're just going to do really well because it's never going to go to 100% you know, you know, think of any any industry like, you know, is there always room for a kind of a startup funky airline? Usually, you know, is, you know, car rental, there's always going to be kind of that niche player and it might be a particular service structure, or, you know, or whatever. But generally, if you kind of put all these when you look at what's happening, this is nothing. You know, it's impossible to predict the future, but you can look at the past. You know, this is a cliche. You look at every other vertical and go, yeah, this, this is how it went down. Like this. There's no mystery here. Yeah. And so the denial of many of these firms to think that they can be that special niche player. There are many that say they will, and many of them won't survive it. And some will. And I think that what I try to stress to these firms is get to know where you are, understand, you know, the Rick, the, the, the amazing kind of focus and absolute focus of these entrepreneurs got them here. You know, they didn't ignore, you know, they were racehorses. They didn't look right and left. They said, I- I've got the guts to build a business. I can sell, I can service, and they're amazing. And they, But they wake up one day, and that's not enough anymore. They got to start looking over and saying, wow, the world is changing around me. So that awareness is the first step, and, and there's some denial there. And I'll tell you, we're keeping really busy every day with firms that are saying, okay, first let me understand what's happening. So we spent a lot of time on that. The next thing is, you know, what do you do about it? And the thing that we like to stress is that stop thinking binary. You know, um, you know, it's the, you know, the Churchill said, this isn't the end. It's not the beginning. It's the end of the beginning. 
I think that for advisor firms who have an opportunity to lock in what they've done, you know, come to a firm that will allow them to continue to do what they're doing with a bigger platform, you know, you're kind of at a lower risk standard deviation. And then to me, Rick, the big thing is that one of the, the most amazing things I see when we bring potential sellers to buyers is this sudden awareness that, wow, I can have a whole nother career over here doing doing it differently. And many of those folks become, go on the management team of this new entity. They become recruiters. They become specialists. And, you know, they're kind of, I don't want to say they're sick of being an advisor, but they've done it for 30 years and like, hey, this is a good change. Um, I can do a lot of other things. So the thing that I stress to these folks is, yeah, you could be, you can survive, but why don't you know and take a real real long look at the the three options and assess that today relative to where you are and make an informed decision. That could be, you know, hold, that could be merge, that could be sell, but, but go into it in a way that you know you're starting a whole new career. So, you know, having an open mind, getting that awareness is critical. And yeah, I think there will be an amount of, of, of niche players at some point. Awesome. Another thing you mentioned and we didn't really get into this last time, so I'd, I'd love to just spend a couple of minutes talking about private equity, venture capital, yeah, and how has that, I guess, sort of come into the retirement ecosystem? What does that mean? And I'm also curious, since I, since I know you've got some interaction there, what are some of those expectations? Uh, you know, I've heard some say, you know, hey, from a private equity standpoint, you know, this, you know, we are a business that you're, you're not going to see this like a software firm or some other firms that I, I know a lot of private equity or venture capital like to invest in, which, you know, can be a 10 or a hundred fold or even more type of, you know, type of return for them. So I guess what is the, what is the attractive aspect of investing in or putting money into the retirement ecosystem? And, and, and again, where do you kind of see that going yeah, I think that, uh, and I've advised a number of private equity firms, Rick, and uh, I would say in the last two years, there's m- more firms coming to us saying, what do you see? What should we be thinking about? And I would say that, you know, that the interest to date has been primary by private equity in the C-suite around benefits and PNC and and retirement, you know, has been mostly to back firms that are growing through acquisition. And what they see is kind of simple. These are relatively smart guys with a lot of money and they li- who like multiples of return, right? So they don't make investments that they don't think that where they haven't predicted the outcome. So, so I would say that, you know, a hub, uh, a, um, you know, an NFP, you know, firms like that, one digital, they're backed by private equity, owned by private equity. They look at the systematic level uh, consolidation and say, as long as we keep buying, and, and, and there are firms that are keep selling, we're going to grow and we're going to get our multiples. And Rick, the, you know, the multiples are, you know, multiples of stock. You know, the Kager is, you know, in the 25 to, to 40 percent range every year. So that's been remarkable just because there seems to it's like Pez. There seems to be especially on the benefits <laughs> of PNC side. You know, there's 30,000 firms out there. 15,000 are acquired and there's still 30,000 left. They just keep coming. So, right. so that, so that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is that as they look at that growth and just to say from a business perspective, and we've done a number of these engagements, if you're in the C-suite already and you're, you're successful in benefits and PNC, you're already there. It makes total sense to then begin to build a retirement vertical next to it. And that's what's happening, certainly with the insurance brokerage side. And I would say that, you know, you know a, a, a more than 50 percent of the buying is going on on that side. And it's not just the consolidation and the economics around that. I believe it's also their viewpoint that the buyer is changing and the buyer is starting to see, you know, some convergence of benefits and, and, and retirement and frankly, wealth. And they're starting to look at the participant and the, you know, the untapped revenue that's there. So private equity, these guys are smart. They're starting to see that. And, and that convergence is a factor. And, you know, we are we have a number of firms that we're talking to now that are looking to acquire 
and then, uh, you know, build out of nowhere, you know, through acquisition, new retirement and benefits firms, and then ultimately put the wealth in, in place. And I think there's a, you know, that, you know, all those things are factors in, in the way they look at it. Well, I got to be honest, that's the first reference to Pez on the podcast. So, so thank you. Well, it's important. You know, you go back to the, I, I actually spent the last couple of days with my granddaughters and Pez is a critical part of being an, an awesome grandpa. <laughs> there you go. For, for all the grandpas out there, that's a good, that's good advice. But on the, on the, on the Pez note, uh, I wanted to come back to Peps as well, because that I thought was an important observation you made there. And, and I got into this conversation the other day offline a little, but also briefly on the podcast where I asked someone, is the future that we're going to have five or six peps that sort of dominate the, you know, the landscape of retirement and really what an employer is going to be looking at is, well, I'm not going to do an RFP for Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab, T. Rowe Price, whatever. I'm really going to be doing an RFP to figure out what pep I should, I should be part of or I should affiliate with. I'm not even sure what the right term is there, but I, I, am I off base there thinking that that this could become, you know, three, five years from now, PEPs could be, the, that that could really be the dominant decision? You know, Rick, you would think so for certain types of, of you know, size plans. You know, we know 80, whatever, 90% of all plans are under 100 participants. You would think that a vast majority of those plans in terms of the plan construct could be covered in a PEP. Then the question becomes, how do you then engage the participants underneath and, and get and, and provide those services? So maybe that's how you delineate it and say, well, you know, we're moving, you know, we're moving to, to some extent to co- some commoditization on plan design, investments, those kind of things. But there's never, in my opinion, going to be a commoditization to how you can engage and assist the participant. You know, my son works for Morgan Stanley. And he assists the advisors and all the branches. And what he says is, Dad, you know, we're trying to get all of the guys to put their money on the, in the managed account programs because you know, the days of these guys, you know, managing money are over. Where we want them to spend the time is talking to their clients about estate planning, about, you know, health care, all the things that are real value adds. And we'll take care of the rest. And I think that's you could look at, you know, PEPs the same way that you could take care of all the stuff. That, that can be commoditized, can be scaled, Rick, around the cost. And then you get to the part that, and it may not be what an advisor wants to hear, but you, you know, I, I don't think technology alone, I think a hybrid of technology and people are always going to be required to then talk to people and help them make the right decisions. So PEPs will play a role. You know, I, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but I got to believe the government, it's interesting, everybody, I am working with a firm that is a large PEP TPA or MEP TPA currently, and it is a very active business. And international firms are coming to the U.S. As you know, you know Great Britain went to a master trust arrangement ten years ago. You know Australia had the Nest programs. You know they worked, they consolidated everything, and they're now coming to this country saying, "Look, we've already done this for ten years. Let us." So there are some firms coming into the states looking and and. And everybody, whether they're DCIOs, record keepers, whoever want to to, to uh, sponsor a PEP, I think the government's going to be a little bit particular around how that works, I would think, that it's not just about economics. It's more about what is it, what's the best structure. No, makes sense. As you look out, and I know we, we've talked a lot about a lot of different stuff starting to look out over the next few years and, and obviously I think a lot of the, the a lot of these trends are just gonna are gonna keep going and the and the snowball is going to keep rolling down the hill if I'm an employer and I'm kind of looking at my plan and I'm looking at my employees and the participants and, and things of that nature in my plan what should I be looking at or what should I be keeping an eye on to make sure that all of this stuff is sort of benefiting me benefiting my company? Etc. Is is are there some litmus tests or success measures that that would kind of help an employer kind of make sure that or, or just tangentially understand if all this M and A is actually working for them? Yeah, I think it, uh, Rick. I I think that certainly awareness. If you're a if you're a, a plant sponsor, you're on the you know, the the committee. You're going to want to have a sense of the services that are provided with your program versus others. 
you know, what are the best in class kind of services? And, and again, there's nothing new here. You're going to want to get a sense of the cost you're paying. And, and, you know, all the great advisors out there are doing a good job there. But I also think you're going to want to begin to see where it's going and have a sense of how can these programs work together? You know, benefits, PNC, retirement wealth, it's all existed in silos, you know, and even within some of the insurance brokerage firms, you know, there hasn't been the level of, of kind of uh, coordination and communication required to effectively go to a plan sponsor. So, uh, or, or, you know, benefit the benefit folks. So I, I think that plan sponsors need to be aware of, of those things. I also think they need to start thinking, and they are doing this about, you know, kind of the, the holistic part of, of this, you know, they have a participant that got limited, you know, bandwidth in terms of focus, they've got limited dollars, you know, they've got all this data, you know, Rick, you know, data is, is, is underutilized. It doesn't have to be separate decisions. And I think that's going to be driven by our side though. I think it's going to be driven by more effective coordination of those programs. And, and I think some firms are going to be able to really put together their benefits, PNC, retirement and wealth businesses in a way that they're able to holistically start working with companies to then. And I don't think it's so much on the large plan side, you know, because there's there's more bespoke programs there and it's harder, but certainly down market. I think that's going to be a thing. So I think it's just being aware. I think it's probably and, and again, I think there's been so many major improvements here finding the right advisor you know, those who aren't working with advisors, you got to, you got to work with one, you know, it's worth every, every penny. And then I think it's just, uh, you know, kind of keeping an open mind. Yeah. Well said. We've covered a ton of ground. I've literally taken you all over the M&A map. <laughs> Is there any stone we've left unturned or anything that we haven't talked about that, that you want to, that you want to throw in there before we wrap up? You know, Rick, I wanted to, you know, we, uh, it's been interesting for me. Um, the, Again, the advantage of being a guy who's done this for 40 years and the power of having, you know, a little bit of money saved and and kind of being at the end of your career and being able to be unattached. You know, for me, it's been a it's been an amazing couple of years being able to work with these advisors who have built these wonderful businesses, but but also being able to kind of, uh, you know, kind of shepherd them through the minefield, so to speak. And you know, I would say to, to, you know, any advisor listening, you know, kind of go out there and find out as much as you can. And I would say, you know, start to think like a buyer. And it doesn't mean you're selling your firm. What it means is on top of cash flow, you want to maximize the value of your business. You want to do that in a way for resilience. You want to do that for your employees, for your families, for your clients. And the way to do that is really be a student of the game. And it starts with, Rick, you know, these podcasts and, you know, keep listening, you know, you find people to help you um, ask a lot of questions. And, and as I said before, don't think in a binary way, really find out what your multiple paths are, compare them both in terms of the journey and, but also the, the, the equity value. And, you know, there's this whole nother world out there. This, this next phase is, to me is exciting and it's a whole new career. And there's so many up, there's so much upside to it. And the last thing I'll say, what I have found in my, in our two and a half years of MMA, it's not about the money. You know, we don't focus on that. I'd say more than half of our firms, more than half have accepted less money because they understood that the match, the fit, the future, they could still get out of bed and be excited is the thing. That's a really interesting comment. It's just, you know, it's really about that. So I would, I would just suggest everybody keep, uh, keep learning and, and, uh, I keep listening to the Rick Unser podcast. <laughs> well, I, I certainly appreciate that endorsement. And and as always, f- unbelievably informative, helpful, timely conversation. Thanks so much for sharing. And d- hey, next year or so, we'll probably come back and knock it again. And would love to would love to see how things continue to to move through the process here. Rick, thanks for having me again. This was uh, always a ball, and and uh, you know, anytime. Awesome. Thanks, Dick. And there you have it, Dick Darian, CEO of the Wise Rhino Group. Great stuff. Not sure if you were to tell when my microphone died or not, but that was certainly a first on the podcast. 
Also, as I mentioned, that episode from back in February of 2019, that is definitely in the top two or three episodes in terms of the number of downloads that it's gotten. So very popular. Dick did a great job. So if you want to check that out, feel free. You can scroll through prior podcasts or go to 401kfridays.com and go to podcast episodes and kind of look through there as well, whichever is easier for you. As I mentioned, we do have a lot of great stuff coming up on the podcast here in the next couple of weeks. So if for any reason you're not subscribed, I would get that done today. You can go to your favorite podcast app and search 401k Fridays and hit subscribe, or you can go to 401kfridays.com forward slash subscribe. And we have a bunch of links and stuff there to help you take care of that. That's it for today. Until next time, I hope you make your Friday a 401k Friday. And now for some disclosures. The content in this podcast is provided for educational and discussion purposes only. Investing involves risk, including a potential loss of investment. Lockton does not and cannot guarantee the future performance or specific level of performance, the success of any investment, or success of any strategy. Nothing contained herein may be construed as investment or legal advice.